one of the most impressive things when people started to scan people's brains and ask people to remember past events, what they found was there was this big network of the brain called the default mode network. It gets a lot of press because it's like thought to be important. It's engaged during mind wandering. And mm -hmm. if I ask you to pay attention to something, it only comes on when you stop paying attention. You know, so people, say, oh, it's just this kind of, you know, daydreaming network. And I thought this is just ridiculous research. Who cares? You know? Um, but then what people found was when people recall episodic memories, this network gets active. And uh, so we started to look into it, and this network of areas is really closely functionally interacting with the hippocampus. And so, in fact, some would say the hippocampus is part of this default network. And if you look at brain images of people, or brain maps of activation, so to speak, of people imagining possible scenarios of things that could happen in the future, or even things that couldn't really be very plausible, they look very similar. I mean, you know, to the naked eye, they look almost the same as maps of brain activation when people remember the past. According to our theory, and we've got some data to support this, we've broken up this network into various sub pieces, is that basically it's kind of taking apart all of our experiences and creating these little Lego blocks out of them. And then you can put them back together if you have the right instructions to recreate these experiences that you've had, but you could also reassemble them into new pieces to create a model of an event that hasn't happened yet. And that's what we think happens. And when I'm, our common ground that we're establishing in language requires using those building blocks to put together a model of what's going on. Well, there's a good percentage of time I personally live in, in the imagined world. I think of, I have, I do thought experiments a lot. I, you know, take the uh, the absurdity of human life as it stands and uh, play it forward in all mm -hmm. kinds of different directions. Sometimes it's rigorous thoughts, thought experiments, sometimes it's fun ones. So uh, I imagine that that has an effect on how I remember things. <laughs> and I suppose I have to be a little bit careful to make sure stuff happened versus stuff that I just imagined happened. And this also, I mean, some of my best friends are characters inside books that never even existed. And I'm, you know, there's some degree to which they actually exist in my mind. Like these characters exist, authors exist, Dostoevsky exists, but also uh, Brothers Karamazov. I love I that book. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few books I've read. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few literature books that I've read, I should say. I read a lot in school that I don't remember, but Brothers Karamazov. But they exist. Alyosha. They exist, and I have almost kind of like conversations with them. It's interesting. It's uh, it's interesting to allow your brain to kind of play with ideas of the past, of the imagined, and see it all as one. Yeah, there was actually this famous mnemonist. He's kind of like back then the equivalent of a memory athlete, except he would go to shows and do this. Uh, um, that was described by this uh, really famous neuropsychologist from Russia named uh, Luria. And so uh, this guy was named Solomon Sherashevsky, and he had this condition called synesthesia that basically created these weird associations between different senses that normally wouldn't go together. So that gave him this incredibly vivid imagination that he would use to basically imagine all sorts of things that he would need to memorize. And he would just imagine, like just create these incredibly detailed things in his head that allowed him to memorize all sorts of stuff. But it also really haunted him by some reports that basically it was like he was at some point, you know, and again, who knows if the drinking was part of this, but he at some point had trouble differentiating his imagination from reality, right? And this is this is interesting because it's like, I mean, that's what psychosis is in some ways, is you, you know, first of all, you're just learning connections from prediction errors that you probably shouldn't learn. And the other part of it is, is that your internal signals are being confused with actual things in the outside world, right? Well, that's why a lot of this stuff is both feature and bug. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, I mean, it might be why there's such an interesting relationship between genius and psychosis. <laughs> yeah, maybe they're just uh, two sides of the same coin. <laughs>